Hello. For video number 17, you can see we're going to be doing question number 24. And this is going to be the first video with a couple of really important ideas in it, that of a probability mass function and a discrete random variable. We will be calculating a conditional probability using this probability mass function, or PMF for short, for something called a discrete random variable. Before I describe what those things mean as I read the problem, I should say at the start that some people call probability mass functions just probability functions. And you should also be aware that other people call them probability density functions, or PDFs. Now, probability density functions definitely have a use in probability theory. However, I think it's best reserving that name for continuous random variables as opposed to discrete random variables. I think it's best, most descriptive in ways I'll describe in later videos, to call them probability mass functions here, PMFs. So let's look at the problem. We've got the number of injury claims you know, perhaps for a company where people can get injured, per month is modeled by something called a random variable. Okay, random variables almost always are denoted by capital letters. That's the first thing to know. Use capital letters for random variables. And what is a random variable? It's got a technical definition. It's a bit difficult to describe. We'll be satisfied with a very intuitive definition. Random variables are just quantities whose values are determined by chance. Okay, the way they are determined by chance in the so-called discrete case is with a probability mass function. This equation right here defines a probability mass function or PMF. I might give it a name. I might call it say little p of n or maybe little f of n. Okay, p, little p here represents the function name. It's a function of little n, not capital N. Okay, you want to think conceptually of little n as being different values, in this case non-negative integers, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. This is a function of little n that gives you probabilities for capital N. The probability that capital N equals 0, for example, is found by plugging in little n equals 0 into here, giving you 1 half. The probability that capital N equals 1, that there's one injury claim in a given month, is found by plugging in n equals little n equals 1 into this formula, which would give you 1 sixth. Okay? The probability that capital N equals 2 is found by plugging in little n equals 2 into this formula, which is going to give you 1 over 3 times 4 is 1 twelfth. Okay? So this function gives you probabilities. Now before uh, I get into solving the problem, you should think about that for a second. That's got to mean two things. The, this function never gives you negative values for these values of n, little n being 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. And it also would have to have probabilities that add to 1. That's not obviously true. I will confirm it in this video, but we'll solve the problem first and then we'll confirm that this really is a valid probability mass function later. The goal is to calculate the probability of at least one claim, capital N is greater than or equal to 1 in a particular month, given that so it's a conditional probability, there have been at most four claims during that month. Capital N is given to be less than or equal to four. Okay, so let's use probability notation to write this conditional probability. Now we're going to depart from the usual practice of using letters like A, B, C, etc. to represent subsets of the sample space. It's best to avoid thinking, typically best to avoid thinking about the sample space here. I mean, it does exist, but we can describe this more simply in terms of capital N. What is the probability of at least one claim that capital N is greater than or equal to 1? Given that, I need a vertical line here, conditional probability, given that uh, capital N is at most 4, less than or equal to 4. That's the conditional probability that we want to find here. Okay. So I want to go back to the definition of conditional probability. It's the probability of both of these events occurring. And by the way, you, I mean, you could think of this as being your typical A, if you like, and this is your typical B. But again, I'm not thinking of them as being subsets uh, necessarily, Okay, even though you could think of them that way. It's the probability of both occurring. In this case, that means n is between 1 and 4, divided by the probability that b occurs, divided by the probability that n is less than or equal to 4 between 0 and 4 in this case. By the way, the fact that this is discrete is ba based on the fact that there's either finitely many possibilities for capital N or what's called countably infinite number of possibilities. 
it's really a countable infinite number of possibilities in this case. Um, you can enumerate the possible values of capital N, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Okay? That's what a discrete random variable is. All right, it's going to be quicker to think of this in terms of the complement rule as 1 minus the probability of the opposite event. But again, we're doing a conditional probability, so effectively we've shrunk the sample space. The opposite event of n being between 1 and 4 is that n is actually 0. Okay, in this case, because n can't be bigger than 4, because we're assuming it's less than or equal to 4. So this is the thing we need to calculate. Uh, so again, you use the PMF, like I talked about verbally just a few minutes ago. To find the probability that capital N equals 0, plug in little n equals 0 here, and you get 1 half. What about this one? There's a less than or equal to there, not an equal to. Here there's an equal to, okay? Um, you need to use the addition rule for mutually exclusive events here. This is the probability that capital N equals 0, or um, the probability that capital N equals 1, meaning add them. You know, the event that N is less than or equal to 4 means capital N is 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. Those can't occur at the same time. They are mutually exclusive, so you can just add their individual probabilities. And you can see the calculation is going to be a little bit of a pain. It's not terrible. Let's see if we can even do it avoiding the calculator here. Probability that capital N equals 0 is 1 half. We already know that. That N equals 1. Plug in little n equals 1. Here we did that already. And you will get 1 sixth. That capital N equals 2. Little n is now 2. Replace little n with 2 here. You'll get 1 twelfth. 1 over 3 times 4. Uh, when little n equals 3, you'll get 1 over 4 times 5, 1 20th. And when little n equals 4, plug it back up there, you'll get 1 over 5 times 6, which is 1 30th. Fortunately, there's a nice common denominator you can get here in the bottom of 60. 1 half is 30 sixtieths, 1 sixth is um, 10 sixtieths, 1 twelfth is 5 sixtieths, 1 twentieth is 3 sixtieths, and 1 thirtieth is 2 sixtieths. So this becomes 1 over 1 half over 30 plus 10 plus 5 is up to 45, 50 sixtieths, which is 5 sixths, 1 minus 1 half times 6 fifths. The 2 cancels with the 6 to give you 1 minus 3 fifths, and that means the final answer is 2 fifths, 0.4, and that is choice B on the sample exam, and that is correct. Okay? So that's the answer. Now, if you're interested, let's spend some time figuring out, is this really a valid PMF? We'll do it by hand first, and then I'll show you. You can check it on Mathematica, my computer program that, you, that I use. Uh, and I'll also make a graph that illustrates the idea of a PMF. Uh, so the, the key thing to figuring, we want to confirm, we want to confirm that the sum of the values of the PMF equal 1. The sum of P of n as n goes to, from 1 to infinity. I'm going to use actually P of k here, because I'm also going to talk about something called an nth partial sum. So I'm going to use a different letter here. We want to confirm that this summation, k goes from 0 to infinity, equals 1. That's the goal. Okay, I haven't confirmed it yet. To do that, you need to understand with infinite sums that you need to think about what are called partial sums typically labeled Sn, the nth partial sum, would be sometimes it's the sum of the first n terms, but in this case, since k starts at 0, it's going to really be the first n plus 1 terms. You want to see if you can figure out a formula for this thing and then let go to n go to infinity. It's not all, always possible to find a formula. Oops, n here. Uh, however, in this particular case, it is possible. What you need to do, however, is use the method of partial fractions. And if you've taken like a second semester of calculus, you know about the method of partial fractions. I need to take this fraction and split it up into pieces, uh, one piece plus or minus another piece. Um, I want to write it as something, call it a over k plus 1 plus something else over k plus 2. I'm going to show you the quick way to solve for a and b here. Um, it's a little bit fishy. It might seem maybe not completely valid, 
but we'll do it anyway. It solves for a and b as quickly as possible. What I need to do is set these things equal to each other and, and multiply both sides by the common denominator. Multiply by k plus 1 times k plus 2 on both sides Okay, of this equality here. Um, you get complete cancellation on the left, just leaving you with a 1. On the right, you get partial cancellation. This thing times that, the k plus 1s cancel, leaving you with a times k plus 2. And when you multiply this thing times this, the k plus 2s cancel, leaving you with b times k plus 1. Now, you want this to be true no matter what k is. Plug in special values of k that make it easiest to solve for a and b, like negative 2 and negative 1. If you replace k with negative 2, this term goes away. You're left with b times negative 2 plus 1 is b times negative 1, um, so that b must be negative 1. And when you replace k with negative 1, uh, now that term goes away and you're left with a, 1 equals a times negative 1 plus 2 is 1, so a must be 1. Okay? Now it's a little fishy because technically speaking this fraction here and, and these two are, these functions are undefined when k is negative 1 and negative 2, the original things here. Um, but you can check it works, okay? I'll leave that to you to check that when you get that, um, when you combine, let me write it this way here. When you write uh, a is 1 and b is negative 1 and write this, that 1 over k plus 1 minus 1 over k plus 2, if you subtract those fractions by getting a common denominator, ignore the summation sign here, you'll get this thing here, okay? You can check that on your own. Now, this may not seem like it's necessarily helpful, but it is. This becomes what's called a telescoping sum. If I write this out, pretending n is fairly large, a bunch of stuff cancels. Okay, do that. When k is 0, I get 1 minus a half. Check that when you plug in k equals 0. You get a 1 and a half there. When k is 1, I get a 1 half minus 1 third. When k is 2, I get a 1 third minus 1 fourth. You see the pattern here? When k is uh, 3, I get a 1 fourth minus 1 fifth, etc. When k is, uh, let's take n minus 1, I get a 1 over n minus 1 over n plus 1 when k is n minus 1. And finally, when k is n, I get a 1 over n plus 1 minus 1 over n plus 2. So again, a bunch of stuff cancels. The minus one half here cancels with this plus one half. The minus one third cancels with this plus one third, etc. Going on, this one over n would cancel with one that came before it. This minus one over n plus one cancels with the plus one over n plus one. The only two things that haven't canceled are the original one and the minus one over n plus two. The partial sum simplifies to this thing. And now you let n go to infinity. Take the limit as n goes to infinity. As n goes to infinity, this fraction goes to zero. You've got a constant divided by something getting arbitrarily, arbitrarily large. The fraction is going to go to zero. The limit is one. And that means we have confirmed that the infinite sum equals one. Infinite sums are kind of funny. You're not literally adding up infinitely many things. You are thinking about these partial sums and taking a limit as the number of terms, or in this case, n plus one goes to infinity. We got n plus 1 terms is what I meant there. Let me end the video by showing you this on Mathematica. Um, here's how you would enter the PMF into Mathematica. Again, I'm calling it little p of n. So I can now find its values. For example, little p of 4. Uh, what did we get before? We got that should be 1 30th. Okay, and here's a numerical approximation to that. 0 0.03 with a 3 repeating. Uh, a part in Mathematica will confirm our partial fraction decomposition. There's what we got when we did the partial fractions. The a is this first one, and the b is negative 1. Uh, this confirms the nth partial sum is 1 over one, 1 minus 1 over n plus 2. This confirms the infinite sum equals 1. And this combination confirms our answer of 2 fifths, which again was choice b on the sample exam. And finally, I got a couple graphs so we can make discrete plot. We'll graph the PMF in this way with vertical lines whose height is given is the probability. So for example, P of 0 is 0.5, which is a half. P of 1 is 1 sixth, which is 0.16 repeating. P of 2 is 1 twelfth. P of 3 was 1 twentieth, etc. 
these go down. I let n go up to, up to 10 here. Technically, n goes on forever. And the heights of these have to add up to 1. So that's how discrete plot looks. If I use a bar chart instead, the graph looks like this. Okay, Similar kind of information. It's the height that gives you the probability. Actually, in this case, it's the areas that also give you the probability. It's going to technically be better in the general setting to think of our PMF in terms of these vertical lines here. That's the technical way we're typically going to want to think about the graph. Thanks for watching.